Okay, today we're at the Linux of Public Market and we are talking about faithfulness. First of all, where did you get this jacket? I love it. What is a virtue? A virtue? Yes. Mm. Quality or uh, things you believe that are good, that okay. are right. What fruit are you most faithful to? Yeah, blueberries. I like my blueberries. You like blueberries too? Blueberries. What fruit are you most faithful to? Apple. Apple? Mm -hmm. Why? Just, they're always around and they're always good. Okay, so what's your favorite pie? Pie? Apple pie. Oh my gosh, that's the perfect <laughs> answer. I was hoping you'd say cherry. Oh. That's all I have. Thank you and good night. I would drop this mic, but it's too expensive to drop it. <laughs> that's awesome. Give those guys a hand. Everybody puts work into that. It is good to see you, Westside Family Church, right here in the North Sanctuary. Good crowd today. Uh, if you're watching online, if you're at our Speedway campus, you're at our South Sanctuary. John Seifert, who actually attends our Speedway campus, is at a baseball tournament in Manhattan, Kansas. So give it up for John and everybody else who's watching online. So let me start by asking you guys a question about colleges, okay? All right. Here's the question. How many of you are KU fans? Okay. How many of you are K-State fans? That's really not the question, but I love to see you guys get fired up about that. <laughs> All right, here's the question, the real question. How many of you, if you're younger, want in to get into a good college, or if you want to get your kids or grandkids into a good college, show of hands. Okay. How far are you willing to go? Have you been following this headline? U.S. charges dozens of parents and coaches in massive college admissions scandal. If you don't know what's going on there, the charges that parents paid a consultant named William Singer to fabricate academic, athletic credentials, and bribe college officials in order to get their kids into prestigious universities. There were fake test scores. There were fake photos. This guy actually coached parents on how to stage athletic photos of their kids playing sports they didn't really play. And in some cases, they actually took stock photos and photoshopped their kid's head on the actual athlete. They paid between $200,000 and $6.5 million in order for their kids to get a leg up on the competition. How do you feel about that? There's kind of an internal outrage, isn't there, about the kind of behavior that would uh, cut corners unethically in order to achieve success? And we live in a culture where expediency is often valued over hard work, where some people, in order to get what they want, will compromise morally, financially, and relationally to achieve the status or the position or the income that is so highly valued in our society. But there's a different way. There's another way, a way that allows you to sleep better at night, a way that uh, honors God and values people, a way that garners the respect of others who know what it truly takes to achieve something of lasting value. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is where we find ourselves as we're making our way through these 30 key ideas of the Bible called believe, and it's made up of 10 key beliefs, 10 key practices, and 10 key virtues. And today we are in week eight of our key virtues, and we are covering the topic of faithfulness. So if you have a Bible with pages that turn, uh, kind of an old school or new school, a screen that scrolls, go ahead and get to Psalm 36.5 or in your believe book, page 453. And what we're going to do, here's kind of the outline we're going to talk about the foundation, the motivation, the invitation, the power, and the reward of faithfulness. This is kind of where we're going. And I think the big thing that you first have to do here is ask the question, why is this such a big deal? And this is really our key question. Why is it important to be loyal and committed to God and others? So let's dive in. Uh, one of my favorite writers is a guy named Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament and he begins it by saying this. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove intelligent. No, it's not intelligent. Uh, it's actually a creative. No, it's not creative. It's charming. That's what it is. No, it's not charming. It's actually faithful. 
This is what is required of a person who has been given something, a life. He says it is faithfulness. Just a number of months ago, uh, I read a book with some of our staff called The Speed of Trust. And Stephen Covey, the author, begins the book with this quote. He says, there's one thing that is common to every organization, nation, economy, and civilization throughout the world. One thing which, if removed, will destroy the most powerful government, the most successful business, the most thriving economy, the most influential leadership, the greatest friendship, the strongest character, the deepest love. On the other hand, if developed and leveraged, that one thing has the potential to create unparalleled success and prosperity in every dimension of life. Yet it is the least understood, most neglected, and most underestimated possibility of our time. That one thing is, say it, trust. That one thing is trust. It's a huge, huge idea. And when it comes to success in every single area of life, uh, here, here's your way you can look at it. Trust is the commodity. This is what we're after. But faithfulness is the currency. This is what we spend. Now, like all the other virtues, the foundation of this particular virtue of faithfulness is God. And so you could say the foundation for our faithfulness is God's character. This is really the starting point of everything. It begins right here. Uh, the psalmist put it this way. He says, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your faithfulness to the skies. And I want to tell you something about the word faithfulness here. Uh, in the Hebrew, it is the word imuna, which literally means firmness. And it carries the idea of something being trustworthy, that when you place your weight upon it, it will not fail. It will hold you. It will support you. And guys, men especially need to be clued into this because men do stuff like this, which is why women live longer than men, okay? <laughs> it's just stuff that we do. Now, Another way that you could look at this is these chairs. Now, you got two chairs here. Which one of these chairs would you sit in if you were holding a brand new baby? That's the one that you would trust. That's the one that you can count on. That's the one that is dependable. Now, when it comes to faithfulness, building trust in all of our relationships is emerging from competency and character, okay? Here's how you look at it with God. God can be trusted because he is able, competency, to do what he says he will do, and he delivers character on what he says he will do. If you read the Hebrew scriptures, you see that God was always faithful to his people, Israel, but they were not always faithful to him. They lived in an ongoing cycle of faithfulness, failure, and forgiveness, faithfulness, failure, and forgiveness. Anybody? It sounds familiar, doesn't it? This is the story of our life as well. But there's good news, right? There's, there's redemption in all of that. The writer of the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, said, because of the Lord's great love, we are not, well, say that word, consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your what? Say it. Faithfulness. I don't know about you, but it's God's faithfulness in the midst of my brokenness that inspires me to keep going on because I'm never going to get it right in this life. I'm going to lose my cool. I'm going to get frustrated. I'm going to protect myself. I I'm going to talk when I should listen. I'm going to marginalize people who don't want to do what I want them to do. And that's before noon, folks, <laughs> right? Does anybody feel that way? It's just, I'm never gonna get it right. But it's okay, God is faithful. And it's his faithfulness that inspires me to want to be faithful. The motivation, you could say, for faithfulness is gratitude. 
Because if it's fear of reprisal or some warped belief that God is gonna love you or me more because we're doing everything the right way, you're gonna be trapped in a performance-based religion that will steal your joy for the rest of your life. Do not do that. Here's the invitation from our key verse. Let's read this together. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. This is the vision that that, uh, faithfulness would be so deep within the depth of our lives, that is the heart, that it would be evident to everybody around us, and that is the neck. It's just everywhere in our lives. This is the key to success with God and people. Now, we know this. It's somewhat intuitive, which is why we make promises to be faithful in our relationships. Now, I've done a lot of marriages, and whenever I'm performing these ceremonies, and you get to that part where you go, now, do you promise to be faithful for richer or poorer in sickness and health till death do you part? Nobody says, no way. No, 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 no. Everybody says what? I do. Everybody says, I do. But not everybody stays with, I do. See, a vow is a word spoken in the moment, but faithfulness is a commitment fulfilled over a lifetime. And if you want a simpler way to understand that, faithfulness is a daily I do. It's a daily I do. There's a Seinfeld episode that describes this beautifully. Any Seinfeld fans in the house? Kind of a boomer reference, but it's still the best show ever. It's the one about the car reservation. And if you've seen it, you already know what I'm talking about, okay? So Jerry goes up to get his car, and he goes up to the lady who's standing behind the counter, and she says, name, please. A Seinfeld, I, I reserved a mid-sized car. She's typing a little bit. I'm sorry, but we don't have a car for you. Well, I made a reservation, Do you have my reservation? Yes, we have your reservation, but unfortunately, uh, we ran out of cars. But the reservation is what holds the car here. Well, sir, I know what reservations are for. I don't think you do, because if you did, I'd have a car right now. You know how to take the reservation, but you don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's the most important part, the holding. Anyone can just take a reservation. (laughs) Faithfulness is the holding. Faithfulness is the holding. It's not just speaking the vow. It's keeping the vow. It's holding the vow. It's being the kind of person in your relationships where somebody says, You can count on her. He is rock solid. They are dependable. Not perfectly. Not perfectly. At least not in my marriage. I mean, as soon as I got married, my vow to treat my wife tenderly was tested in a big way. Uh, We were leading a singles ministry at Pantico Bible Church in Arlington, Texas, where Randy Frazee and I used to serve together. And we had taken the the singles to go snow skiing in in, uh, Colorado. And we checked in, and then we made a snack run. And as we're going down the aisles, I discovered something I hadn't seen in a long time. It's frosty root beer. And I was like, oh, my gosh, frosty root beer. I grew up drinking this root beer in Orlando, Florida, and I hadn't seen it in decades And so she's like, whatever. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Frosty, the best root beer you've ever had. She's like, that's that's fine, whatever. I'm like, I'm gonna buy some. Do you want me to buy some for you? Not not really. Are you sure? Because it's the best root beer you've ever had. No, I'm sure. Are you you positive? Yeah, I'm not in the mood for root beer. Not in the mood. It wasn't the last time I heard that, by the way. (laughs) So, so... So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get my frosty root beer. So, so I got my frosty and we got back to the condo and we had this big gathering. There's hundreds of people in this room and I'm living large. You know, I got my ice cold body of frosty in my hand. 
And then I look across the room and I'm kind of puzzled because it looks like my new wife is holding a bottle of my root beer. <laughs> I immediately kind of dismiss it because she wasn't in the mood, so I know that could be true. So the closer she gets to me, sure enough, there she was, clenching firmly in her tight little fist a bottle of my frosty root beer. And I said, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> she said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm like, what are you doing with my root beer? And she said, well, I was thirsty. And I said, but you told me you weren't in the mood. And she said, well, I wasn't then, but I am now. I'm like, that's my root beer. And she said, well, since we bought it with our money, I thought that I could have one. I'm like, no. And she said, well, I see a lot of other people around here that are drinking some of the root beer. And I said, well, I bought enough for me and for some of my friends, but I didn't buy enough for you. And that's when I think, it gets cloudy. That's when I, that's when I think she hit me in the head with a bottle of root beer because everything went dark after that, you know. Now, it's gotten more complicated over the years. It's been less about root beer. And it's been more about other things. And I know for many of you, there's a lot of pain around the issue of faithfulness in marriage. Some of you are in the thick of it right now, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You are feeling the tension. Others of you are just blindly going about your own way, and one of you is about ready to find out it's not as good as you thought it was. You're completely unaware. Aaron Beck who has given his life to the study of human behavior, and particularly marriage, says that in, there are different things that damage a marriage, but he said they typically come through big exits or little exits. Big exits are the more obvious, uh, more overt departures like divorce and betrayal and abandonment. Little exits are the barely noticeable steps where you and I move away from oneness escaping through shopping or TV or addiction or social media, just little things. And every big exit is preceded by a thousand little exits that erode the foundation of faithfulness. There's an eagle song called Lion Eyes about a woman who drifts into the arms of another man away from her husband. And it has a very insightful lyric about how little exits can lead us into places that we never imagined we would find ourselves. It goes like this. She wonders how it ever got this crazy. She thinks about a boy she knew in school. Did she get tired or did she just get lazy? She's so far gone, she feels just like a fool. See, nobody sets out to go down the wrong path. Nobody has a vision of being unfaithful. And oftentimes, it's not because we did so many things wrong. It's because we were not intentionally focused on the one thing, the daily I do. We lost sight of this vision. And this is kind of the key uh, idea here. I have established a good name with God and others based on my loyalty in those relationships. And that statement is one of three things. It's either a testimony, a vision, or a prayer. It's either a testimony where you say, this is my reputation. I have a track record of faithfulness in all of my relationships. This is me. Or it's a vision. Maybe you're young, starting out in your faith or starting out in a marriage and you're, you're an adult now. You're really dealing with the intensity of relationships and you're like, this is my vision. This is what I wanna be. Or it's a prayer. Because you've blown it. You wrecked your marriage. You lost your friends. The respect of your children. You torpedoed your job. And you're wondering is there any way for me to move from here to here? There is. Because God is always faithful to you and me, even when we are not faithful to him and to others. And whether you are winning or aspiring or recovering, this is one thing that is true. The power for faithfulness is the Holy Spirit. It's not you. 
The writer Paul reminds us in Galatians chapter five, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, say it, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God makes faithfulness possible. You don't grind it out, and you don't take credit for it. It comes through the daily I do of the beliefs and the practices that we've been talking about over the past 28 weeks. That's what makes faithfulness possible. I read a fascinating scientific study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology recently about uh, the, the, the correlation between the practice of prayer and faithfulness. And researchers found that in the study, they took a group of people and the spouses prayed uh, consistently and specifically for their spouse every single day over a period of four weeks. And the other people in the group did not. And what they found is those people who engaged in that daily specific prayer for their spouse began to see their relationship as holy and sacred, which led to intense feelings of romance and intimacy with their spouse. Now, I never thought I'd see the day when science would say prayer can actually spice up your sex life. (laughs) But apparently it's true. And so, gentlemen, figure it out. There are many reasons that you should be in prayer. But the point is, is if we lean in and live faithfully, not perfectly, but in our brokenness, have deep dependence upon God and his power, then something very special happens. He says, there is a payoff. There is a reward. Faithfulness yields a reward in this life and in the life to come. In this life, I've seen it in my own experience as a pastor over 25 years, and I think the data supports it. In this life, here's what you're gonna have. You're gonna have a thriving marriage. You're gonna have better friendship, respect of your peers, admiration of your kids, customer loyalty, leadership influence. We know this is true. And in the life to come, the applause of God. The applause of God, and I love this idea. You see, this life will end, but there is a new life that is emerging in the new heaven and the new earth. And though the rewards of faithfulness in this life are great, there is something that is far, far greater. And I know it doesn't feel like it's that big of a thing now. They say, oh, that's eternity. That's so far away. Yet I guarantee you, nothing will matter to you more than standing before your heavenly father in that moment and hearing him say, well done. Nothing. The Apostle Paul, who was 100% motivated by eternal reward, says it this way when he considers the end of his own life. He writes, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought, listen to these three words I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, there are three very powerful word pictures from these three words that were just mentioned here. Let me, let me show them to you. There's fought. It's the word agonizomai. Uh, from where we get the English word agony. Why is that there? Because being faithful will cost you something. When everybody else is sliding sideways and compromising, you are intensely engaged to be loyal in your relationships. The second word is teleo, which means to fulfill something. It is the same uh, word that is used when Jesus hung on the cross to secure salvation for all of humanity, and he said, it is finished. Not it's over, it is complete. I have fulfilled what I have come to do. And the other word is the word tereo, it means to guard. It's like a soldier would guard something. It's the same word the soldiers were guarding the tomb of Jesus. It means to protect. It's the same word that is used in Jesus' prayer to the Father when he prayed for you and me. He said, protect them by the power of your name. 
And what I find to be really interesting here is that Paul isn't claiming his reward because of all of his accomplishments, though they were many. He planted tons of churches up and down the Mediterranean coast. He, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, 14 if you count Hebrews. He was the most influential person in the spread of Christianity throughout the first century. But this isn't why he's claiming his reward. No, no, no. He's claiming his reward, this crown of righteousness, this beautiful thing for the one thing that you and I, we all have access to, and that is this, faithfulness. Anybody can achieve that. The reward is for anyone who is excited about Jesus to, to return because they know they have been faithful, not perfect, but faithful, and they are gonna hear God say, well done. It is for anybody who says, this is me. This is my testimony. This is my reputation. Pastor and author John Ortberg uh, talks about a guy who figured this out. Uh, it was a guy who went to his old church when he was there in Chicago, uh, and, and he described him as kind of a, a ripple maker, a, a guy where uh, just good kind of ripples out from him. His name is Larry Clark. You ever heard of him? No, you haven't. That's what makes us even better. See, Larry was just kind of this quirky single guy and uh, didn't have any family, didn't really have a lot of influence. He quit his job at age 30 to work at the church for free. He's just this guy who kind of believed in people. He's the kind of guy that would come alongside you and he would say, hey, you know what, you ought to lead a small group. Come into my small group and he kind of develop you and train you and then release you. And you ought to be on a serving team and help you find out what your gifts are and your passions are and then kind of release you to serve. Hey, you know, you, you ought to go on a, on a mission trip. I think God would really use you and God to do something in you. And so he'd get him on a mission trip. Just kind of came alongside this kind of quirky single guy. Didn't really have a job. Uh, one weekend, there was an all-church uh, small group leader retreat. And Larry came and in like fashion, he brought tons of people. And Saturday, they all went out jogging, and Larry stepped off a curb, was hit by a bus, and killed. Just like that. It was devastating. The next day, they had to go back and uh, prepare for a viewing. They didn't know if anybody would show up. Larry never got married, didn't have any kids, didn't have any family, didn't have a job. So many people showed up for the viewing that 800 people stood in a line for three hours to walk past the casket of this jobless, quirky, single ripple maker named Larry Clark. Orberg says, the next day we had the funeral and for the 10 years that he had served in that church, only once did they ever move a funeral out of the chapel into the auditorium that held thousands and thousands of people and that was for a single, unemployed, quirky ripple maker by the name of Larry Clark. And after the funeral, nobody talked about his possessions and nobody talked about his accomplishments, just his capacity to love. This quirky, single, unemployed guy named Larry Clark. And the ripples kept going out. There's a guy named Doug who's doing inner city work in the name of Jesus in Chicago. There's another couple that is working in community development in Africa in the name of Jesus. There's a gal named Jules who wasn't a follower of Jesus, and she came to Larry's group. She became a follower of Jesus, became a life group leader, led a bunch of other people who became followers of Jesus, and they're leading groups, and it goes on and on and on. Larry has been dead for over 20 years, but the ripples keep going out and out and out and out. Will yours? Will mine? They can if we remain faithful. Let's pray together. Well, God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. We know that's the foundation of everything, and it is your loyal love, it is your compassion that woos us and inspires us to be faithful to you and the people that you have placed in our lives. Thank you that you have implanted within us your Holy Spirit who gives us the power 
to be faithful because it's simply not something we can do on our own. Thank you that you forgive us when we fall and that even though we have the cycle of faithfulness and falling away and forgiveness, you keep leaning in and you keep loving us and because of that, we are inspired to follow you. And I pray that you would strengthen us all so that we can live with a great anticipation of the crown of righteousness because we have been faithful and we get to hear you say, well done. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.